Welcome, my friend, to the On the Blue Line podcast. I am your host, Wayne Mulder, and I'm uh, excited to be back with you again this week. This is a law enforcement podcast where uh, we discuss topics that will empower you on and off the job. Maybe you're tired, you're frustrated, feeling overworked, struggling to balance your work and home life demands, or maybe you just need some encouragement. Either way, I'm glad that you found us. This is the 155th episode of the podcast, and on today's podcast, something a little bit different. Uh, Just in light of the tragedy in Memphis, we're going to talk about that and what uh, my thoughts are on what it means for society and for our profession. If this is your first time listening, welcome. We have two weekly podcasts. The one you're listening to is Morning Roll Call. It typically comes out on Monday. However, if you're watching this, it didn't come out at five o'clock on Monday this week, uh, just because there were some things we were waiting on getting some information on. But essentially during the week, uh, Morning Roll Call is just you and I. We sit down discuss news, recent events, law enforcement trends, and a variety of other topics that's going to give you something to consider as you begin your week. And then the other show is called The Interview Room, and that's a weekly interview show that typically comes out on Thursday mornings. And in there, I sit down with guests from all walks of life who can offer us something beneficial that's going to help us in our personal or professional lives. Uh, This uh, last episode, if you haven't listened to it yet with Mitchell Tucker, good stuff. Uh, It really was a good conversation around mindset and some of the things he's doing uh, with the oath and so forth. So if you haven't uh, looked into what Peaceful Savage is all about, I I certainly encourage you to find that episode, listen to that episode, and then go to the show notes and see all the great things that Mitchell is doing. And this coming week, I sit down with Vic Ferrari for probably one of the funniest uh, episodes with a previous law enforcement officer that I have had the opportunity to sit down and talk to. So you're going to want to check that out. Just know that uh, these shows are available everywhere you stream your podcast. But as always, YouTube and Rumble is where you'll find the videos and you can get more information at on the blue line, O-N, on the blue line dot com. All right. So all the stories this week are centered around the tragedy that occurred. Uh, I'm sure you have heard about the Tyree Nichols incident that occurred uh, actually back in early January, but came out when they released the video this last Friday. So we'll go back and um, reading, looking at an article from the Daily Wire that came out on the 27th. The overview, which I'm sure you have seen in the news and heard about, is that five former Memphis Police Department officers were arrested and charged in connection to the incident uh, for their alleged involvement in the death of 29-year-old Tyree Nichols. He uh, died on January 10th, three days after Memphis Police had pulled him over in a traffic stop. Uh, Nichols and the five former police officers are black. Uh, Authorities stopped Nichols on January 7th for reckless driving near Rings Road and Ross Road in Memphis. He runs away from that. And they end up officers Tadarius Bean, Demetrius Haley, Emmett Martin III, Desmond Mills Jr., and Justin Smith have all been charged with two counts of official misconduct. Uh, Local media reported with one count of official oppression. Not 100% sure what that is, but I'm sure it is what the word says. Second degree murder, aggravated assault, act in concert, and two counts of aggravated kidnapping. Uh, it, tragic, uh, listening to his mother, uh, Ravon Wells, uh, quoting when my husband and I got to the hospital and I saw my son, he was already gone. They had beat him to a pulp. He had bruises all over him. His head was swollen like a watermelon. His neck was busting because of the swelling. They broke his neck. Uh, My son's nose looked like an S. They actually beat the crap out of him. And so when I saw that, I knew my son was gone. The end. Even if he did live, he would have been a vegetable, end quote. So this incident is clearly a tragedy. Uh, Very disappointing and disappointed in what occurred with law enforcement. It's very aggravating. It's very unprofessional. You know, you, you pick the word that you want to use to describe it. Uh, the, I will say the videos are hard to watch. Uh, there is a link below in the show notes. If you have not seen the videos, uh, it links to one of the articles from the daily wire where they had four of the videos that were released. There's a lot of video. Honestly, I didn't watch all of it. Um, I kind of skimmed through a lot of it and then watched some of the uh, key moments in it. So obviously, and for good reason, uh, this incident has gotten a lot of traction and it's been discussed by a lot of people across the country with a lot of different perspectives. So bottom line, uh, 
obviously there are so many things that were done that were wrong, that were criminal, and the system worked the way the system was supposed to work. And that's what I want to get to here in a moment. So if you're watching this on the TV, you'll see some of the video. Again, this is just a couple uh, moments of the video from uh, this tragic incident. And I encourage you, if you do want to see uh, more, if you have more questions, to watch the entire thing. However, since then, there has been some news uh, organizations, CNN being one of them, and a commentary uh, from Van Jones that came out where he tried to paint this as something that it's not. So I want to start with saying a couple things that it's not, right? So first of all, uh, it's not racist. Uh, it's tragic, but that's the one thing we know about this. Everyone involved in here, we're all of the same race. Um, not only was everyone involved, both the uh, suspects and the victim uh, who is deceased, but the entire chain of command, for the most part, at least all the ones uh, up to the chief that I'm aware of and uh, at this community are all of the same race. So to even pretend like that's what we're dealing with here is insane. Uh, however, uh, Van Jones had this to say. In a recent opinion piece on CNN.com, Van, um, you wrote, the police who killed Tyree Nichols were black, but they might still have been driven by racism. And I was struck by the part of the piece where you wrote this. One of the sad facts about anti-black racism is that black people ourselves are not immune to its pernicious effects. Society's message that black people are inferior, unworthy, and dangerous is pervasive. Over many decades, numerous experiments have shown that these ideas can infiltrate black minds as well as white. Self-hatred is a real thing. Um, so you believe this racial bias played a role in the officers' behaviors? Yeah, I, I do because, um, first of all, uh, uh, black people are at risk from police no matter what color. Uh, black, white, brown, you talk to African Americans, I'll tell you, um, it, it doesn't matter. There's this per pervasive view from law enforcement that if you're black, you're dangerous. So, <laughs> listen, I... The problem that we have here with what he is saying is it requires a certain worldview, right? Or a certain view of the United States. And it's not a proper one. And it actually does a lot of damage. It's this idea that this is somehow systemic. And that's the second thing that it, this is not. It's not representing any kind of systemic issue within law enforcement. Ironically, the same people who are making this claim are the same ones that are comparing it to the Rodney King incident which, by the way, was in 1992. That was 31 years ago. So if you're trying to use this to draw some sort of parallel to some systemic issue where these kind of tragedies are occurring all the time, you would have a better illustration than one from 31 years ago to compare it to. So it, those are what it's not. It has nothing to do with race, and it has nothing to do with a systemic issue. The third thing that it is not, it is not a reason to riot. Now, fortunately, as of the time recording, part of why this one got out a little bit late, there hasn't been any widespread rioting that I've been able to find any news articles or any information about. There was obviously concerns of this. The chief of police had even cautioned and said, you know, let's not do this. The mother of uh, the decedent had said, hey, the victim had said, hey, listen, uh, this isn't what he would have wanted. Please don't do it. So there's really not much to protest here because the system, after the initial tragedy, worked the way the system is supposed to work, right? So that's the first point that I want to make. So uh, there's three things that it's not, but then there are some things that it is. And first of all, the system worked the way it should after the tragedy occurred. It was investigated. The perpetrators were located. They were charged. There's all sorts of video from uh, both street cams as well as from body-worn cameras. And they've all been charged and are going to be held responsible and they're going to have their day in court. And I always want to be careful with that because even though there does appear to be overwhelming evidence that what they did was wrong or clearly wrong, but egregious, like anybody, they still need to have their day in court. They still need to be able to face their accusers. They still need to, you know, have this information come forward and then a jury of their peers will decide 
you know, what, what happens to them. And then at that point, you know, that is, is what it is. But as always, I, I don't want to jump to any conclusions, even though it does appear to be fairly open and shut, but we don't want to jump to any conclusions earlier in the same way that we wouldn't do that for anybody else in this country, because that's your right. You, you know, you have the right to uh, face your accuser and to uh, be tried by a jury of your peers and so forth. I, I think one of the other things that this is, is it really tells us there was an environment of group think. There was this environment where nobody took the took a moment and they were all kind of in this theory. In fact, honestly, in some ways, it kind of looked like a street fight and not really a street fight where both sides are, but you know, where you'll see these videos and you'll see these incidents where a group of males, uh, typically males, I'm sure females as well, but typically males will like, uh, surround the victim and they'll take, uh, turns like swinging on them and kicking on them and so forth. That's kind of what this looked like. It almost looked like a, some sort of tragic street type incident where, uh, just completely outside the realm of professional law enforcement, use of force and so forth. But what was tragic is that everybody was kind of in this moment and all of them, there were multiple people, right? And there are multiple su subjects all together and in concert and nobody, nobody stands up and says, uh, hey, this isn't right. Hey, stop. We're not going to do this. Nobody is that person. You know, I've talked about it before, but there is this uh, philosophy, there is this uh, group, this organization that is starting to come uh, to a lot of different agencies. And it's great when agencies do get on board because they have a lot of very specific rules as far as pretty much everyone in the agency has to go. There has to be reoccurring training. But it's something called ABLE. It's active bystandership for law enforcement. And it, it hits on this exact issue, this exact conversation somebody has to be willing to stand up and say, we're not going to do this. This isn't going to happen. This is, you know, to see those warning signs long before it became what this became, but those early warning signs, you know, something that happens early on in this video is there doesn't really seem to be any de-escalation. In fact, if anything, you would argue that the law enforcement officers were constantly escalating the situation rather than de-escalating it. And that's one of the fundamental things that I think we all can agree on. You absolutely, when um, when you're dealing with a subject who may or may not be complying, you've got to de-escalate the situation. You have to be willing to lower the temperature in the room. Now, there's a danger, and again, stepping away from this case entirely, because this case is obviously uh, a, a completely different animal for what it became, but stepping away from this case entirely, obviously, at the same time that we need to de-escalate and we need to lower the temperature in the room, and that's 100% true, it's also 100% true that at the same time, law enforcement needs to be ready to react or to act in uh, any sort of officer safety situation, right? Because uh, sadly, in the environment in which law enforcement operates, it can go from zero to 100 hundred in a matter of a second, right? You know, you can go from what is a conversation to uh, a justified shooting, for instance. Taking that obvious statement and putting it on the side, going back to the incident at hand, nobody seemed to be lowering the temperature and nobody seemed to step up and say, hey, listen, I don't know what's going on here, but this is not going to happen. We don't do this. This isn't how we treat people. This isn't how what we do with subjects who we are investigating. Some other things to consider with this situation, uh, there was a follow-up news article that came out from the Memphis Police Department uh, where they announced over the weekend that they would be disbanding this anti-crime task force that these guys were on. So the Memphis Police Department said Saturday night that it was ending what they called the Scorpion Unit, uh, an acronym that was Street Crimes Operations to Restore Peace in Our Neighborhoods. After officials met with uh, the Chief Davis to discuss recent events, uh, quoting, this is what she had to say, in the process of listening intently to the family of Tyree Nichols, community leaders, and the uninvolved officers who have done quality work in their assignments, it is in the best interest of all to permanently deactivate the Scorpion unit. The officers currently assigned to the unit agree unreservedly that th with this next step, while the heinous actions of a few cast a cloud of dishonor on the title Scorpion, it is imperative that we, the Memphis Police Department, take proactive proactive steps in the healing process for all impacted. So she's absolutely right on that end of it. And listen, the issue wasn't necessarily this group. 
uh, having a specialized group. I mean, there's all sorts of, all sorts of agencies have specialized targeted enforcement groups that aren't doing this. They're doing good, solid police work. They're professionals and they're treating people with dignity and respect. So to two things can be true at once, right? But in this particular case with this particular Scorpion group at this particular agency, you, you have to ask yourself some questions, right? Like who was in charge? Did the, is there a sergeant in charge of this unit? Was he out there? What what was he doing? Was she out there? What was she doing? You know, who? what was the experience level? And I'm going to get a little bit more to that here in a second because there's been some follow-up articles that have come out. And then also the training and the hiring standards. You know, what what are we training them? What are we doing things like ABLE? Have they been through some sort of active bystandership for law enforcement where you talk about, you know, tragic things that have happened in the news? Like I believe it was last year or uh, maybe even the year before with the sergeant in South Florida uh, who goes after the subject and the uh, female officer realizes, hey, Sarge, you can't do this. This isn't how we treat people and grabs his belt and then he decides to choke her. You know, that is a good illustration of an officer, her doing the right thing, stepping in there and saying, Sarge, I mean, here's her superior and saying, no, 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 we don't do this. We treat our suspects, we treat subjects that we're in contact with, with honor and respect. And that's what we do. So um, there was another article that came out and the title of it says, cops charged with murder of Tyree Nichols hired after job requirements lowered. So the New York Post, which is what they're referencing for this article from the Daily Wire, said that um, Bing and Haley joined the Memphis Police Department during the summer of 2020 as riots related to the death of George Floyd rocked the nation, said that it came two years after the department significantly lowered the education required. Uh, The lowered standards means recruits no longer need an associate's degree or 54 college credit hours to join. Now, just taking that at face value, listen... I didn't have a college degree before I came to law enforcement, but I had a lot of life experience before I came to law enforcement. So I don't 100% always buy into the college requirement as the hill to die on, depending on what other factors are present. Because quite frankly, with the cost of going to school, it, it can be very foolish for families if you're not sure what you're doing or if you're already doing something else, say running a landscape company, to go get a, you don't need a college education to run a landscape company. So why would you go into debt unless you had some sort of way to pay for it? And if you did, by all means, get the degree. But I I don't know that that in and of itself means what they want it to mean. However, the writer of this goes on and said that lowering requirements meant there were less desirable candidates, which they have in quotation marks, who were being brought in by the department. And then it, there's a quote here uh, where it says officers were not hired through the normal process that the department had implemented. According to a source within Memphis PD, the five charged officers were hired through the usual were not hired through the usual structured PD hiring process. City leaders felt the existing process was too strict and kept certain people from getting jobs in the department. City leaders began their own hiring process and then pushed new hires into the agency, bypassing the testing procedures in place at the department. You can read between the lines what that all means, In quote. Again, I'm quoting. So then again, quoting, all five of the charged officers were hired by the city and didn't go through the rigorous PD testing process. This is what quota hiring looks like, lawsuits and dead innocents. The city should pay the lawsuits instead of the police department. This murder wasn't created by an old school policing or by white supremacy. The murder was directly facilitated by liberal policy, end quote. So there's something to look at there, right? Because that's a, one of the other questions that I had is not only their training standards, but also the hiring standards uh, for bringing the right people in with the right temperament to do this job. That is absolutely an important part of it. So, um, The last thing I want to do is I want you to watch this little uh, clip here. This is from that same CNN interview where they were talking with Van Jones about his uh, about his thoughts on what this incident was all about. And here's his solution. Unfortunately, the federal government still has not passed a single piece of legislation since George Floyd to make a difference. Thankfully, uh, 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 President Biden did do some executive orders. It's not enough. And so I think it's time now for us to relook. Uh, here we are almost three years later. There has been no federal change in, in the law uh, to make this stuff uh, go away. And so I think that uh, uh, this, this should be a chance for us to relook re- at it. I kind of want to end today on this point right here. 
there's one thing that we absolutely must never consider. So Saturday after, you know, they had released the video on Friday and I'd kind of watched some of it and had some idea what was going on, you know, just the broad strokes of it. Uh, I had went and I was getting my hair cut and I'm sitting in a barbershop talking with someone. And in that conversation, the incident comes up as it does. And we talk about the news and so forth, just like anyone does in a barbershop, right? So in the middle of this conversation, we get into this conversation about federalizing law enforcement, federal oversight of law enforcement. And I, I cannot stress this enough that that is 100% not the answer. Now, you can make an argument for um, accreditation at the state level, uh, more oversight at maybe the state level, better training, um, de-escalation training, able training, on and on it goes. There's so many things we can do that because just like any profession, law enforcement isn't perfect, right? It's not made up of perfect people. So there's all sorts of things that law enforcement can do to get better and must do to get better. No issue with that whatsoever. However, the answer, as with almost everything, does not lie with the federal government. That is a dangerous, dangerous road that I assure you, you do not want to go down. As I sat there and talked to this person, great guy, great, um, great perspective on a lot of things, but he just never really thought of it. So we talked about it in, um, at length, and I said, think about it. You know, think about what happened in 2020 and what we saw and how it was really in some states, depending on the state that you lived in, it was your sheriff who was either saying, hey, I'm going to uh, enforce this or not enforce this based on what the Constitution said. Um, look at what's going on in Illinois. I just talked about it a couple weeks ago where you have sheriffs, again, standing up saying, hey, listen, we're going to follow the Constitution, not necessarily the whim of you know the legislature. And, and that's a different conversation I'm going to be talking even more about here in coming weeks because there's been some subsequent news stories since then where there seems to be this thinking that just be, well, anyway, that's a road I'm going to go down in the future. But for right now, the point is, is you do not want to centralize your policing power of a nation into one location, especially a place as um, like Washington, D.C. That would be the biggest mistake we could make as a country. You want to keep your law enforcement as local as possible. I talk about it all the time, how law enforcement is the face of the government that most people have the most interaction with. And they're the last level of the government usually between the government and you. So coming both directions, that is the lying level where the government and the citizen meet the most in almost most in most situations. You want that person as local as possible. You want that agency as local as possible. You do not want a nationalized police force. You know what happens with nationalized police forces? Uh, there's some lessons in history we could probably look to. Um, I'll let you be the guess of what era of history and what country, but um, there, there's probably, I don't know, start around the 1930s and just see what you come up with. In all seriousness, it, it's... It's so far beyond the pale of a, our, what our constitutional republic was meant to be that you do not want to go down that road. That is not the answer in any way, shape, or form. And what is interesting and disparaging and concerning is the fact that that seems to be what people are trying to push for. That seems to be why these special interest groups are behind uh trying to create the chaos, trying to create the riots. Uh, you heard what Van Jones had to say. I mean, this is exactly what they're wanting to do is, hey, we want to burn this system down, then we're going to bring in a federal police force who's going to pretty much be at the whim of whoever is in power in Washington, D.C. Look what they're doing with the military. Look how they're changing the requirements of who can be in there. People with certain views they don't like. Hey, we're going to wash you guys out. You're not allowed to be here. Hey, if um, you're not willing to take our experimental this or experimental that, you need, to, uh, you need to leave. You can't be here. I, I would think that at this point, after being through the last few years, we would all see the dangers of creating a federalized police force. That's, that is so far beyond the pale of what we would want and what we need to do in this country. So something to think about at the end of my conversation on Saturday, uh, the great guy again, um, 
you know, he said, no, that makes perfect sense. And the more we talked about it, he was like, you know, I hadn't really thought of it that way. But now that you're mentioning it, I can see why that is. See, sometimes, and, I, and one last thing I want to say on this, sometimes when people, when we look at something, we're like, man, th this just seems so hard, right? It's, it's difficult. And, and it wouldn't be so difficult if we could just streamline it, you know, it, we could make it safer. The problem with that is you don't want things to be necessarily easier. This, I'm going to step on my soapbox real quick, but this is what you're seeing on right now, like with even, even Congress, right? People are like, oh, well, uh, it's a negative that, you know, there's pushback and things aren't going smoothly and there's, you know, dissenting opinions and arguments and, you know, we, we may have to wait to fund this or that because, you know, things just aren't pushing through. That is the point... <laughs> of our government. <laughs> that is literally the way the system is supposed to work. It is supposed to grind to a halt. That is why you don't have, one, that's why we're not a democracy. You hear people all the time use the term democracy, democracy, democracy. We use a democratic process, but we are a constitutional republic because you don't want these things to roll over you like a steamroller. You want the system to grind down and to move very slowly and there to be actual um, them on the floor yelling and shouting and pushing back and saying, no, we don't want this or yes, we do want this and here's why and appealing to the American public and then having to come home and be as close to you and I as possible. That way at the next election, you know, you can be like, hey, listen, Bob, Bob, you had a chance to vote the way we put you in Washington for, and you failed miserably. Bye, Bob. That's the way the system is supposed to work. So I want to finish with these final thoughts. The death of Tyree Nichols is a tragedy. When I first saw the videos, they were hard to watch. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking for the family. Heartbreaking for the community. Heartbreaking for the thousands of law enforcement officers around this country who hold themselves to a high standard of professionalism and do not tarnish the badge. Agitators, race baiters, bad actors have once again tried to hijack a tragedy in their continued attempt to usher in a self-proclaimed utopia that I can assure you that if and when it ever arrives will be some weird conglomerate of seemingly contrasting ideals such as Marxism and socialism and oligarchy and fascism in a dystopia that is so tragic and so destructive that something like that could only have been spawned in America. The lesson here really is simple. Mankind is sinful. Mankind is not inherently good apart from the Creator. All the rules and regulations in the world will not stop tragedies from occurring. The lesson for all of us actually revolves around training, hiring standards, accountability, de-escalation programs, and on and on it goes. Law enforcement is a noble profession that often holds itself more accountable and to a higher standard than citizens ever could, and this is a great thing. Law enforcement is not perfect, and to be clear, never will be perfect this side of paradise. Rather, law enforcement must be in a continuous process of improvement, eliminating those that tarnish the badge from their ranks and beholden only to the Constitution and to the people they serve. That does it for this week's Morning Roll Call. I'll see you Thursday in the interview room. I'll see you next Monday in Morning Roll Call. But in the meantime, I'll see you on the Blue Line.